Good morning, and welcome to Moments with Melinda. I am your host, Melinda Moulton, and today I have as my guest, Dr. Scott Thomas. Hi, Scott. Hello, Melinda. Good morning. How are you on this sunny, warm February 8th day? Never better, thank you. I'm in Washington, D.C., and you're in Vermont, so you're in DC. I'm in a suit. You are. You're not. No, well, I'm not. I, maybe I but should. But I'm doing great. Maybe I, I should. had a chance to meet with our fantastic congressional delegation, and we are. Uh, I'm heartened by how well represented we are in in Vermont. So, but I'm doing great in answer to your question. Aren't we lucky? Well, let me let me tell my viewers a little bit about you. Dr. Scott Thomas is the twelfth president of Sterling College. Scott has 25 years of teaching and leadership experience at private and public institutions. He is a first generation college student. He has devoted his career to advancing programs and policies to expand access to quality college opportunities and ensure student success and build diverse organizations. He holds a BA in sociology and a PhD in education policy, leadership and research methods from the University of California, Santa Barbara. There you have it on that. Now, I'm going to jump right in because I want you to share a little bit about your childhood and being the first person in your family to go to college. My childhood, boy. Well, it's pretty uh, pretty simple. My father was a professional baseball player, uh, eventually for the Cincinnati Reds. He uh, met my mother in Florida in what they call the Grapefruit League. Um, he was originally from uh, Connecticut, Massachusetts. Um, and, uh, so that was his, that was his career and, and his life met my mother in Miami. Um, and, uh, from there they carved out a, a, a pretty good existence. He, uh, was out of the, out of the, uh, game, so to speak, pretty quickly, uh, due to an injury and, and went into insurance and did pretty well with, with that. But, uh, as a result, uh, I'm the first one in my family. I have a younger sister who, uh, Followed me and graduated from the University of Central Florida as well. So uh, my parents did pretty well setting us up and kind of reminds me of the, the maxim that I carry around. Uh, the most important thing you can do is, in life is choose your parents really well, because that's where advantage comes from. So it's really true. So was, my next question was for you was, who do you feel have the greatest impact on your life choice to enter the field of education? Oh, um Mr. Satava, I guess every every educator has that person that that really uh, had a had a profound impact on them. I wasn't a very good student in high school. In fact, I was a pretty rotten student in high school, um, and in middle school too, for that matter. Uh, but we won't go back to middle school years. Um, uh, I, I my grandfather was a an engine in an undegreed engineer with uh, Eastern Airlines. Um, and, uh, he flew a lot. And when I was about 12 or so, he said, Hey, you know, you keep on the straight and narrow and I'll keep you flying. And so it gave me a motivation to really buckle down in school and think about, um, uh, the, the applied nature of, of everything I was learning, you know, a train leaves station A at 1242 and arrives at station B at 213. That didn't make much sense to a lot of my peers, but to me that it, it did because I was applying it every day, which is a connection to Sterling College too. But the, the the answer to your question, of course, my grandfather had a, a, a huge impact through that. Um, also, uh, the teacher that I encountered in high school who looked at me and said, Scott, you know, you're kind of wasting my time and you're kind of wasting your time. Let's come up with a plan. And we came up with a plan and I wound up in the community college nearby uh, during my high school years and uh, really got pretty serious about math and computer science and uh, languages. And it was, uh, that, that was a, a pivotal moment in my life. I love those stories about educators who help educators to become educators. So, you know, you, you were obviously born in Florida. What, what, what was your journey to get you up to Vermont? What brought you to Vermont? Well, uh, I guess I father followed in my father's footsteps in some ways because I was a, 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 a my father was a pretty good athlete. I was a pretty good athlete, but I, I was a not very good professional surfer, um, and uh, at least not good enough to to really uh, make it on the on on the big league. And the big league was a pretty minor thing when I was was growing up. But I wound up, as you mentioned, at the University of California, uh, at Santa Barbara, which was a great choice for uh, a surfer. Um, and it turned out that it was a great choice for a sociologist. And I, I have to say, Melinda, that when you introduced me as a sociologist, it warmed my heart because that's what I am through and through. 
think of thinking about the relationship between structure and agency. And as I traveled around uh, much of the world surfing, uh, I had I had that that lens on kind of looking at different societies and looking how people interact with different societies. Um, and I decided I, I I wanted to pursue that. You know, what college access looks like, how education makes a difference in people's lives. So uh, I became an academic. My first job was surprise. Uh, Hawaii, University of Hawaii, where I was at the University of Hawaii for for six years. Uh, and um, uh, as my career progressed, I was at the University of Arizona, the University of Georgia, the Claremont Colleges for a while. And then at the Claremont Colleges, I became an administrator and I was dean of a college of education. Um, and uh, I got to thinking about uh, where I might make a big impact. And uh, I became aware of an opportunity at the University of Vermont. Um, they were looking for a new dean for their College of Education and Social Services. And I said, well, what do I know about that? I applied and I absolutely fell in love with the place. Um, and it was it, 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 that was another transformational moment in my life is coming to Vermont, working in Vermont in education. Uh, the spirit of everything we were uh, kidding around a little bit before we, we we came live and you talked about sort of the hippie nature of things. and. But there's the back to lander piece of it that that was an inspiration, and there is the kind of uh, harder reality of the, the the libertarian roots that sit under a very thin topsoil of liberalism and progressivism in the state, and a long tradition of education that cuts across this thing. It, it, it was just absolutely inspiring to be in Vermont doing that. I went to Wyoming um, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, just a variety, there's a variety of opportunities to think about uh, doing some different education projects around competency-based education and working with teachers on scale. And frankly, I was really curious to know what it would be like to work in the political environment that we're in, in a very, very conservative place. So I traded uh, Bernie for Liz, and uh, Liz didn't turn out to be a great day because she got thrown out of office. I'm being a little irreverent here. I probably shouldn't be, but uh, the point was that there are very good people um, from all different perspectives. And I had a great opportunity to work with some some fantastic legislators that I just don't agree with uh, uh, on much. Uh, but we had a productive relationship. I learned a lot. And lo and behold, uh, Sterling College was looking for a president. And um, uh, I was not ready to leave Wyoming, but I was ready to take a hard look at Sterling College because it has always been an inspiration to me. A uh, bit of an enigma, but also an inspiration. We, we could explore that if you want. So well, here we, we are, are back we are, in Vermont. Well, we're going to move into that. So my husband went to the University of Hawaii, and he got his beginning in film by making surf movies. <laughs> okay. All right. I, I got to get the two of you together. I mean, he never was a great yeah. surfer. He's a great skier. Never, And he always got, you know, but, but anyway, we'll get into that. Do, have you watched the series The 100 Foot Wave yet? Yeah, I, I, I have. Okay. I mean, not, I, not my cup of tea. Well, I'm not a surfer, but my God, to see what those 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 people and the women. I mean, it's an extra because I'm not. a. But anyway, I was very moved by it. And um, so let's talk about Sterling College. Um, Sterling College is 100 percent environmentally focused college up in Craftsbury Common. And I, I'm going to encourage my my viewers to go to the website at sterlingcollege.edu. Uh, and the college has about 125 students and offers both a two and four year undergraduate degree in environmental science. So talk to us about Sterling College. And and we have a lot of questions about Sterling, but tell us a little bit about your love of Sterling College. Yeah, well, the, the, the love of Sterling started when I was at the University of Vermont and uh, we were putting together some programming on place-based education and what better place to do it than, uh, you know, where John Dewey uh, sort of, you know, began his, his good work across his career. And we were convening a group of uh, Native Hawaiians and Maori from New Zealand and a number of others uh, at Shelburne Farms of all places, which is a great place to do that. Um, and uh, I had come through Craftsbury Common. I'm a pretty uh, avid Nordic skier and biathlete as well. And so I, I had spent a bit of time in, in Craftsbury and I was very curious about Sterling College. So I stopped in one day, uh, met the then president, Matthew Durr, wonderful, wonderful person. Um, met a couple of the faculty and I explained what we were doing and they listened to me very patiently. And and I said, you know, it'd be really nice if a couple of you came over at, at, to, to Shelburne Farms. And this would, would have been 2017, 2018, somewhere in there. Um, and they did. And they were part of this gathering that we had uh, on place-based education. And I always was struck by the thoughtfulness, 
um, the, um, the the consistent connection to the principles that were important to us in place-based education and, and in learning, and uh, their uh, a central connection to the land that they uh, work on in, in, in Craftsbury is very, very different than anything that, that I had seen before. So um, that was the, 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 the Sterling connection. Now, now the reality of Sterling <clears throat> coming back and uh, actually you know, being a, a, a key part of the community is that uh, everything we do is connected to the farms, uh, the gardens, the forests, um, our, our fiber studios, our forages. Uh, we work in the morning in academic intensive uh, courses. We come together as a community for lunch each day. We're a small place, so we, we, we do this as kind of part of how we operate as a community. And then in the afternoons, we uh, engage in what we call experiential endeavors, where we're applying the, the academic learning that we're, we're engaged in in the morning uh, to real world projects. We're, we're one of um, uh, 10 work colleges in the country, federal work colleges, where every student or uh, on our campus, every student engages in work as part of their time at Sterling. Uh, and this is through the federal work study program. And uh, what they earn from that work goes toward uh, helping support them. Uh, at Sterling with their tuition and, and their fees and such. Uh, but it's a very, very different model than you find at, at most institutions. We have, or our semesters are broken up into three big chunks. Uh, we're constantly outdoors. Um, we are uh, uh, kind of building a lot of activities around things like our winter expedition where our students uh, uh, make their way back to campus from quite a ways away over a, a multi-day period of learning about their environment and applying their skills in navigation and map making and these types of things. So uh, there's really nothing like it that I've seen, Melinda, and it's an honor to be there. Is that when you say place-based, what does that mean to my viewers? What does that mean, place-based? Well, it means that everything we do is connected to where we are. So we, we make sense of the knowledge that, that we, we develop and the knowledge that we draw in. We make sense of that in the context of the place that we're located. In our instance, it's the Northeast Kingdom, the North Country, Grassbury, however you want to, to segment that. But um, we want to learn about uh, you know something in in the environment or ecology uh, or outdoor education. Uh, all that draws from the communities where we are. We try not to have a town and gown relationship. We try to be part of a larger community that's embedded within. Uh, the locale that, that, that we exist in. So you go to the farms, you go to the forests, you go to the rivers and the wetlands, and they become your classrooms. So do you also do you also focus a bit on socially responsible uh, thinking um, at Sterling College as well, because environmental and socially responsible sort of tie together? Is there a bit of that? Right. right. Yeah. Uh, that, that's, that's key. You know, it's, it's interesting. I was just uh, in a conversation with, with somebody here in Washington and they, they use the word sustainability. Um, and, uh, I realized that, um, they were using the word sustainability clearly in a, 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 a squarely colonial capitalist context. And I don't know that we really want to be sustainable. We can't uh, in that be context. sustainable. We're, we can't be. We have to be adaptable. I, I tried to make that make that point. I don't know that I was very successful, but uh, yes, we're we're very socially conscious. We're we're socially conscious when we think about uh, you know what sustainability means, who's sustainability, who 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 what is who, who is advantaged when we talk about sustainability. Um, we do a lot of work in sustainable agriculture and sustainable food systems in a different way. Uh, where we really think about inequalities and who has access to uh, good nutrition and, and who has access to land that's viable for uh, being able to uh, regenerate and, and promote uh, well-being of, of, of all people in the communities. So, so I, you know, why don't more people know about Sterling College? I mean, do you have a, do you have a limited amount of people? Obviously, you can go to Sterling. I don't know if you do an online program, but you only take so many students, but. I have heard of Sterling College, but I didn't know a whole lot about it. Why, why is that? I think you should be, I mean, I think everyone should know about this college. Well, of course, as the president of Sterling College, I, I want everyone to, to, to know about Sterling. And you well, know, I, I, gave, I think everybody has a story about how they encounter Sterling by driving through Craftsbury. Um, <laughs> right. we're, uh, we're a very, very, um, uh, we, we operate on a very, very thin budget. And, and we always have, this is, this is part of our, our identity. 
we, we use, we reuse things, we rehash things. We don't have big marketing and advertising budgets. Um, and uh, much of our recruitment over time has been through uh, networking and in word of mouth. Yes, there are only, we have 120 beds on campus. Uh, so we have a capacity of a physical capacity in residence of 120. How many apply? Um, How many people apply every year? Uh, well, it's very self-selected. So we actually, if you look at our acceptance rate, it looks very high, but it's artificial because it's very self-selected. When people learn about Sterling, they come and make a case that I want to be a part of this community. So to get that far, um, they're already self-selected uh, pretty clearly. But the point to to your question, the point being that, um, you know, there are only like 100, 120 slots. Our average enrollment for the last 10 years has been about 100, uh, you know, covid uh, took a beating. We took a beating through COVID and we're, we're, we're growing back from there. Um, but it's uh, it, 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 it's something that we're working on and making sure that more people know about Sterling. I can think of so many young people who would go nuts for this college. I mean, you think about the college experience or even the online experience of going online. But anyway, I, so I hope that my show helps to to uh, to educate to educate my viewers out there about Sterling College up at Crassbury Common. I'm talking to Dr. Scott Thomas, who is the twelfth president of Sterling College. So I was on your website. You publish an annual journal called Terrain. Students and faculty contribute to this publication, and it's super informative and cool. I love the recipe from Liz Shadwick for Bavarian beer, beer, cheese, and bunzels, but I also really enjoyed the article, Traveling Through the Watershed, which was written by Farley Brown. Um, talk to us a little bit about this journal and how do people get, get a copy of it? And tell us about this, Scott. So but let me take a step back and then come to the journal. Uh, the online piece, which is connected to the journal and outreach, the journal is clearly a vehicle for, for, for outreach. Um, we have a, a program, if you go to the website, you'll see uh, called EcoGather, which is uh, basically it's, it's it's an online learning environment for people who are interested in some of the most cutting edge topics on on uh, food systems and uh, how we create uh, a, a, a more, I, I'm avoiding the word sustainable now that I, I, I adaptable, brought it adaptable. up. Adaptable, use adaptable. Yeah. Yes. So, um, uh, but also connected to that is how we communicate about uh, some of the other things that we do and some of the expertise that we have. You note the uh, both the column by Liz, our yeah. our uh, great chef and and head of kitchen at at, at Sterling, and Farley Brown, one of our yes. uh, faculty experts there. Uh, Farley's fantastic. You know, we've got a great faculty. They 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 write in this train. It's a fairly young young uh, publication, and uh, we're we're we usually. Pre- uh, release it in the fall. I came in in the summer and we decided that we were going to hold it until uh, later in the spring when we'll we'll uh, be likely to be releasing an issue again uh, in, in the summer of that. And uh, thank well, you for I'm, highlighting I'm, it. Oh, I am. And I'm going to put it up as soon as we're done. I'm going to get up on my social media um, that I met with you today um, to talk to us a little bit about the Sterling Capstone Project. Yeah. So every student, um, it, it is it is said every student you know, their studies culminate in in a project of, of some sort and uh, I had the, the pleasure of uh, sitting through presentations and students that were graduating in, in the spring but it's very much like it, it I think uh, similar to how you might think about a thesis at a traditional uh, college but these are often very applied so we had students uh, doing capstone projects on leadership with youth groups and in the summer we had a uh, student do a fantastic uh, uh, presentation on a project that they were doing with um, uh, algae and you know, water algae. And and uh, we had a, uh, another student that was focused on tanning uh, and, and all the different ways that you can tan different types of hides. Um, and again, all all real world connected skills. Um, you know, we, we I, I heard somebody the, the other day talk about uh, the role of colleges and in, in encouraging dreaming and, and really getting people to think big. Yeah, we're dreamers, but we're also doers at, no at, at Sterling. And, and I think that's manifest in, in these capstone projects. That so, there's a, so there's a practicality to this, this college, which really appeals to me. So you also have a work program where students can develop their skills and refine their interests in the work program. Talk a little bit about that. 
Yeah, so uh, the campus is run effectively by students, and we have a staff of uh, less than 50. Uh, every student uh, has a job. This is part of us being a, a designated federal work college. Um, students are uh, working in the kitchen. Students are working in, in the offices. We have a lot of students working on our farms with animals and working in the gardens, uh, running our CSA and, and these types of things. So everybody has a hand in the functioning uh, of the Sterling community. And Did it's, ever, uh, again, another very unique feature of Sterling. Well, the other unique thing is that you have social support groups for BIPOC folks and also for the LGBTQIA and Pride community, too, that you have these support groups. Uh, talk a little bit about the, the diversity up at Sterling. Yeah, so, uh, you, you know, diversity in, in places like uh, Vermont is a, a challenge. Certainly diversity in rural areas are always a challenge. Um, uh, and speaking of challenges, I was challenged by some students uh, recently about, uh, hey, we have we fly the Black Lives Matter flag, we, we fly the pride flag, you know, great. But is that just performative? What are we doing? And uh, so these are constantly uh, conversations that are coming up. And again, you know, the, we, the COVID years, it was difficult to to really engage in, in, in that work meaningfully uh, in, in a physical way. So we're finding new ways to uh, to be able to support those principles and try to diversify our student body and our staff constantly at, at, at every turn. Those are priorities for us. I uh, wish we could be making more progress on them, but uh, we're, we're relentless in our commitment to that. Linda. Good for you. Yeah, I, I really love seeing that. So I, I, I've told you this one before this, the show started. But, you know, I, I love Sterling College. I have fallen in love with this college, and I probably would have loved to have studied there. Um, I wish I wasn't so old. Now, even your dining experience, 30% of the food that you serve, this, the students, they grow 30% of the food. Right. Yeah, exactly. And in fact, it, here's an interesting factoid, and I'll send you the link to the, to the group that, that has done this. Sterling College uh, is ranked number one in North America for its farm to table, I'm, I'm short circuiting their, their phrasing for its, its farm to table food system. Uh, we like to think that we're operating in a circular uh, economy and a circular food system and a circular culture where everything that we do is brought back to uh, our community. So we try to source everything uh, as locally as we can, whether it's grown on the farms or at the gardens, or whether it's uh, coming from providers that are, that are in our area. So again, top priority and we've been recognized uh, for that uh, internationally. So can my viewers who are up in Craftsbury, can they drop in and 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 walk around and uh, visit? Uh, you, you have, what, 130 acres up in Craftsbury? It's one of the most beautiful yeah, parts. 130 acres, 130 oh. acres in Craftsbury. We would love people to stop in. Again, this is something that I, I've been struck by that uh, in COVID, there was a lot of discouraging of people mingling and coming across campus. And so I, I've been, every, at every turn, I've been asking people to come visit uh, we'll happy to give you a tour, um, come in and meet our great uh, admissions team and in our outreach group. Uh, we would love to see you. I would love to meet folks. If they want to come by. It's a, it's a pretty flat place. You know, I come up and knock on my door. I'd love to say hello. That's fantastic. What a what a loving gesture to invite us all up there. So it's up at Grassbury Common. So I'm going to pause for a moment and take you to the world today that we live in. Uh, it's February 8th and it's sunny and dry and unseasonably warm. Um, Scott, what is your vision for the future of humanity on this planet? The future for my future of humanity on this planet. Um, I pause because I'm I, I'm I'm coming from Sterling College with this answer. Uh, you know, I think anything that we say in in relation to a question like that can be seen as insufficient and, and trite, but. Uh, it really all starts with the community. So what I see for the future of humanity is that, uh, when I say the, the global is the local in, in some important ways. I have a colleague who, uh, our, our dream weaver at EcoGather, likes to talk about cosmolocalism and how everything emanates from uh, our local relationships. And this, is, this again, is something that uh, I think Sterling can be a model for and emblematic of, of all of our activity has to think about the community and everything that we do should reflect our community values and, and our community resources, you know, not just in Sterling, uh, not just on the Sterling College campus, but across the community, across the region. Um, you mentioned, Melinda, it, jokingly, that you're old, you said that yourself. 
Well, I'm older. Yeah, yeah. I'm older. Thank but you. I'm, I like but that. I'm, but I'm truly only 14. I just, okay. old, but I'm older, but I'm really just 14. Being six, being 61, but being 14 too. Um, another uh, piece of that future uh, is about learning and the way we think about learning. And um, I, I talk about her age because when people think of Sterling College, they traditionally think of Sterling College. Oh, it's a, it's a college, traditional college age students. There are young people there and maybe some old people on the faculty and maybe an old president and all this business. Um, but we're really focused on how we create a community of learners trying to provide learning opportunities around the environment and ecology to span from preschoolers, folks who are retired that might want to come back and think about, you know, I want to learn a little bit about, uh, you know, uh, uh, food systems, or I want to learn how to shear sheep and think about how to spin wool and maybe make a blanket. And, you know, these are the things that we do very hands on. So thinking about lifelong learning as part of that ecosystem of of, of the future is, is also That's key. Beautiful. So all of my viewers, um, if you're thinking of going to back to college, look at Sterling College because it looks like it's really where we need to be right now. So I want to ask you a question, and this this is one that's kind of bothered me with the environmental movement. Um, the environmental community um, doesn't really ever embrace uh, reducing human population in their movement. And I have, I did propose this question to a very famous environmentalist at the Sanders event a few years ago and population never comes up. And, and sometimes, and oftentimes the environmental NGOs do not work closely with reproductive rights groups. And I think one of the issues in our world is that there are, that our population is growing and we're not learning how to uh, protect the earth with this growth. And I'm just wondering how you see this. Um, with the environmental and the reproductive rights community? Well, um, certainly an issue and uneven growth and growth uh, growth that is contested on a uh, capitalist and I think even militaristic uh, uh, basis of need is, is problematic as, as well. So, yeah, growth is certainly, I'm thinking of the population bomb, you know, from the book from the uh, uh, 20th century. Uh, this is this has long been an issue. Uh, reproductive rights certainly figure into that. Importantly, um, what you know, what how we engage and mobilize around that is something that you know we we would cover uh, in some of the issues that we explore at, at Sterling. Um, how we go out and mobilize to affect it. Uh, that's uh, that's the future pepper. of our graduates and graduates from other areas. So there's, with the political situation, um, what it is, we have two wars, democracy on the line, authoritarianism rising around the world. How are our young expected to navigate this new political maze? Well, clearly with the challenges that we're seeing, not just on college campuses, but mental health and well-being challenges, uh, we're all wondering that. This is front and center uh, on the minds of many, including me and my colleagues uh, at, at Sterling. Um, it's about trying to understand uh, agency and trying to uh, think about uh, how we take the knowledge that we have and the privilege that we have uh, to bring to bear on improving the conversation. Again, that sounds cliche and, and a bit trite, but it, it all starts with uh, these types of dyadic exchanges and working into, into larger groups. The information, the knowledge, the sharing, uh, some of that is contested in ways that it, it, it never has been. Uh, I think we're reckoning with a moment of social media uh, where truth is uh, a far more relative idea than it ever has been. That's part of this problem. So again, back to how do we build trust within communities and trusting relationships with one another uh, toward improving the condition in which uh, we're having debates about uh, you know existential issues like those that you you and, know, and, democracy and, really concerns me right now. And unfortunately, oftentimes we're talking to the choir, you know, we're talking to the choir, we're talking to each other, and it doesn't get out of the beltway. I mean, in Vermont, we live in this bubble. Now, do you believe our country's educational system is growing our young population to deal with the realities of our time? Uh, very unevenly. Um, I, I joked earlier that single best decision one can make is choosing their parents wisely. Uh, the inequality in education, the education system itself is is a real issue. And that would be a great place to start to think about how we advantage the disadvantage disproportionately here. 
And uh, I've been dean, so the a dean of colleges of education for the last 12 years, uh, and understand quite well the, the challenges associated with um, getting resources to the people that need them most to to address some of those inequities. This is one of our biggest challenges in the country. Absolutely, and and I think Vermont does a pretty good job educating our our young here in Vermont. Um, so Sterling was one of the first colleges in the nation to divest its endowment from fossil fuel extractors. Um, bravo on that. I want to give you a high five on that because I was involved in in trying to do that in some of the other colleges and in some instances we failed. So I wanted to give you a shout out on that. Yeah, it's very important to us. It really is. Um, so uh, I, I did talk about my age and I didn't, and I got to tell you, age is so relative um, cause I, I, but anyway, I, I was part of the sixties revolution. We talked about that too. And we tried to transform our social and environmental vision, but I'm not so sure as a generation that we succeeded in doing that because human behavior is inherently driven to seek its own self-satisfaction. How do you think we're doing? Well, clearly there are challenges, but there were challenges 300 years ago too. <laughs> but back, have you read, um, the book, have you read the book Sapiens? Cause back then, they weren't destroying the. They weren't destroying the the home that they that they're living on. They and, and okay. they they were. I mean, we 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 inherently do things that are not in our best interest, and I find that, and I and I'm and I'm part of that. I don't I don't disengage myself from that. And um, have you have you read the book Sapiens? Uh, no. Okay. Well, it, I loved it because it took because it really took you through the growth of human human beings and. Um, I, that's what I love about your college is that you're educating young people to to feel the earth, to feel to be engaged. In, and we, so many of us live above the earth and we're not engaged in it. And um, and we're coming to the end of this show. And there's so much that I want to talk to you about. And I think I'm going to have to do it separately over dinner or, or lunch or something. But um, I think the work that you're doing is exactly what humanity needs. I guess that's my point. Well, thank you, Melinda. And, and I believe it, too. And that's why I came to to Sterling College. Um, it is a moment for uh, colleges like Sterling. I think Vermont has been a great context for experimental colleges. Um, they've struggled. They We've learned lessons from them. Uh, I think Sterling is is an exemplar for uh, how we might think about uh, learning be high school. And as I said earlier, learning across the lifespan as it relates to the environment. Um, should be an exemplar for the rest of the country and in the world. So I think that over the years ahead, you will see uh, an increasing reach of Sterling and increasing opportunity to engage with Sterling uh, on these issues that you're highlighting on, on your show about the future of our planet. I want everyone to know about this college. And, I, you know, I, I would love to I would love to see you know, CBS Sunday morning come up and do a story on the college. I think, and you know, I think it would be great to take this model and move it into the women's prison where we can take the women out of prison, put them in a, in an educational environment where they're growing their food and they're, I mean, I, I just think that this, this model could be used in so many areas of our humanity. Mm -hmm. um, well, so I, I want to I want to just thank you for all that you're doing, Dr. Scott Thomas, um, the president of Sterling College. I hope this has been valuable and that you've enjoyed your time with me. And um, I really appreciate well, thank you. It would be hard not to, Melinda. I, oh. I enjoyed your questions and the engagement and your appreciation for what we're doing at Sterling. And I'll, I'll come back to uh, something that you asked about earlier, uh, visiting with us. Um, we are a very place based uh, college and uh, nothing like seeing it in place rather than online. So we'd welcome your viewers to uh, to come join us at any time. Come uh, enjoy our wonderful dining hall for breakfast or, or lunch, and uh, we would be happy to uh, to show you around. Thank well, you. I'm, I'm definitely I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring my I'm definitely gonna bring Rick up because you have to talk about University of Hawaii and surfing, and surfing movies. Um, and I think our viewers should get up. It's Sterling. It's SterlingCollege.edu is their website. It's a beautiful website. There's so much information, and um, I encourage you all to go visit Sterling College. And for Dr. Scott Thomas, thank you for your time, my friend. And I hope to see you. Uh, I have so many more questions that I want to ask you. I want to pick your brain. So thank you for your time, my friend. Thanks, Melinda. It's been fun. Okay. Bye-bye.